This clip is brought to you by SaveWithConrad.com. Well, let's talk about John Tenta. Of course, Earthquake. And man, I got to tell you, this is an episode I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, back when we did uh, polls in 2016 and 2017, I was all in on Earthquake and he just never won. But damn it, we're making it happen because he would have been celebrating a birthday coming up here in a few days. He was born on June 22nd, 1963 in British Columbia. And the first time I see John Tenta is watching primetime wrestling or superstars of wrestling or something like that back in 89. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about that segment, but when did you first meet John Tenta? I first met John Tenta in, I believe Rochester, New York. Um, I don't know. It was upstate, maybe Buffalo. One of the two, I know it was upstate New York and John had come in for a tryout. I remember going back and looking at this huge mountain of a man. So he was a big, big man, tall and just big. And people have been talking about him and Vince said, can the guy talk? And I walked down and I introduced myself and said, Hey, let me ask you a question, man. I said, uh, you know, can you talk? Can you cut a promo? And he stood up and immediately went, you want me to cut a promo? And he went into this whole big, long promo. And I sat there and I said, okay, well, I guess you can cut a promo then. And, uh, the rest as they say is history. Let's, uh, start at the beginning. He grows up a big wrestling fan, specifically, uh, Don Leo, Jonathan and Gene Kaniski. And they both inspire him at a young age to want to become a pro wrestler. And he decides the route there is to first become an amateur wrestler. And he does well becoming a Canadian junior champion in 81. And shortly after his 18th birthday, he finishes sixth in the super heavyweight category at the world junior wrestling championships in Vancouver in 83, he won the teenage world championship and got the only takedown against another future wrestler, the late great Gary Albright. And he winds up winning an athletic scholarship to LSU, where he's going to compete in NCAA collegiate wrestling. And at LSU, he was nicknamed Big John. He lettered for the Tiger Varsity wrestling team and participated with the football team. And eventually LSU would drop Varsity wrestling to comply with Title IX in 85, which forced Tenta to choose a new sport. So he walks onto the football team and plays in some uh, games as a defensive lineman. He's uh, sort of known as the quiet giant and joins the rugby union for the LSU rugby club. So he's very athletic, which I think some of our younger fans may be shocked with, you know, just when you see his physique and, and presentation, but once he leaves LSU, he actually does go to Japan to train as a sumo wrestler. He'd been recruited by a former Yokozuna who met Tenta on a trip to Vancouver. So in October of 85, he finds himself joining a sumo stable. This is just so much to unpack. What an unusual, you know, trek into the business. First of all, being from Canada and then getting into NCAA wrestling and LSU and then trying your hand at football and rugby and then sumo. It reads like, uh, I don't know, a feel good movie. Talk to me about his inspiration though. Cause these are a couple of names that some of our listeners might not be familiar with Don Leo, Jonathan and Gene Kaniski. Who were they and, and, and what was their impact on the game? Well, Don Leo Jonathan was the Mormon giant and he stood about six foot 10, I'm guessing now, but he was uh, an extraordinarily tall man. He was very giant. Like he had an incredible rivalry with Andre, the giant early on in Andre's career. And Don Leo Jonathan was a guy that he was an attraction in and of himself. He used to travel across the country across the world to come in as a special attraction for local markets. Uh, so I actually got to see him wrestle twice and he did one of the weirdest things that I'd ever seen in a match was he started unlacing his boots in the middle of the match and then it worked a little more and then he would unlace his boots and, you know, have the long string hanging down from his boots. And then he would, finally get the boot off, get the both boots off. And then he would wrestle the rest of the match barefoot. And it wasn't really for, you know, like, uh, somebody was working his ankle or working the leg in any way or stomping the, it was weird. 
He was, he was different. Um, met him many years later at, at a convention and a very, very nice man, just as polite and kind as could be, but had traveled, traveled the world as a giant and also traveled the world as the opponent of Andre the Giant for a long time. So he was, he was the first, I think he may have even been a little bit before Andre as far as being billed as a true giant. And then Gene Koniski, good Lord. Conrad, who did Dory Funk Jr. defeat for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship? Gene Koniski. Gene Koniski! Canada's greatest athlete, Koniski, was uh, the NWA World Heavyweight Champion from, I believe, 66 to 69 or 68. Um, big brawling. He was a Canadian football player and had a horrible body, <laughs> but he had the same promo. You know, I'm the, the greatest athlete from Canada, the greatest Canadian athlete ever. And he was big. They called him Big Thunder. Gene Koniski was, in those days, your NWA champion had to be a legitimate tough guy because they were always afraid someone was going to try and uh, shoot on you and steal, double-cross you and steal the NWA title. So you had to be tough and able to handle yourself, and Koniski was double tough. Um Again, another one who very, very nice man. And I worked with his son, Kelly. I worked a little bit with Nick. Nick wasn't in the business as long. Nice. I think Nick had more of an aptitude for the business than Kelly did. But um, Kelly Koniski was someone I, I took under my wing a little bit when he came to Houston because he was Gene Koniski's son and he was really a fish out of water and wasn't sure that he wanted to be in the wrestling business. Well, let's talk about John Tenta venturing to Japan. When he goes over, he's six foot six, 422 pounds. He catches on to the sumo lifestyle and sport very quickly. In fact, he won all of his 25 matches and then ultimately decides, Hey, this might not be for me in July of 1986. He would say, uh, nothing I've ever done, not football, not college wrestling compares with the kind of physical abuse you inflict on your body in sumo. And we should mention the sumo world frowned on the large tattoo of a tiger on his left arm. And he would have to, uh, get it removed by skin grafts. If he was going to do higher level competition in Japan, tattoos mean something totally different than they do over here, but he loses a good bit of weight. During this whole sumo training, I think by the time he actually jumps into pro wrestling, he's down to 380 pounds. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.